Hi, I am Arjun Gavasetti, class of 4 in class 2012. Okay, so um, one of the major threats to users today in malware is called botnets, which is like a network of hacked computers controlled by an attacker. Like the attacker can also be called a bot master, and the victims, like the end hosts, the computers are called bots or zombies. But just for the presentation simplicity, I'm going to call them bots. So um, botnets are like really hard to find in, because they mask themselves in the system processes, so they're like really hard to be seen. Um, like they often disguise themselves like Microsoft OneNote or just random applications that you'll never think of. And they can't really be caught by antivirus programs because they're kind of useless. Um, so botnets like recruit sus susceptible victims by using the same techniques as other malware. They can piggyback worms or just general viruses. That's generally what they do, in fact. But sometimes they're spread by like download, a like EXE file, they're stupid enough. Um, <laughs> once the computer becomes a bot, the bot master can siphon off processing power to the computer, like of the computer. So when you get a bunch of bots and siphon off all their power, that's a lot of CPU that they can use. So it can be used for distributing spam, cracking algorithms, encryptions, breaking in, whatever they need to do. So. Um, Gathered bots aren't really that useful for a bot master, so he rents them out to cyber criminals, which will, you know, do whatever. If they're like anonymous, they'll DDoS someone or, you know. So they're generally used for illegal activities, but I think there's a couple legal ones. There's a the NAS SETI one, I think. I'm sorry. Yeah. SETI. There's one for SETI, the like online like uh, space SETI, right? Yeah. yeah Search for extraterrestrial. And you can donate your uh, CPU voluntarily um, for that botnet. Mm -hmm. It's completely legal. So you can like some of the activities that the botnets can do are like email spamming, identity theft, software piracy. Um, I have a picture which kind of demonstrates the life cycle of the botnet. So don't follow me. This one. Okay, so I'll just kind of like go through it. So first, the bot master will find an exploit, which in, I guess the common ones are in Windows XP in 2000, because like, those can be cracked in like 10 minutes or something very short like that. So um, the exploit will be transferred from the botnet to a vulnerable, vulnerable host, which will contact the botnet and download the bot software. So at this point, the vulnerable host is now a bot. So it'll communicate with the IRC server. I think our professors went over it yesterday. Right. Um, the IRC, IRC server is an internet chat relay, which it allows you to chat back and forth usually with users. But bot masters can send commands through it, and then the bots will do the commands. So it'll join the IRC server and just wait for uh, the commands. So once it receives a command, it will press the commands, and it'll do whatever on the internet. Okay, so presently, uh, some are spread by HTTP protocol, but most of them are still IRC because that's what they used to be, and it's just easier that way. Uh, so the reason they use IRC is it's really flexible and it's open source, so like the bot master can change it depending on what they're doing. Uh, and it, uh, so like every time the bot contacts the IRC server, it'll just wait for commands. So you can kind of see it, I guess. It'll be an open port, like 6667, I think is the port for IRC. So if you port scan yourself, I guess, you can see that the port is open. And if you're not using IRC, then you know something is asking for commands. So that's one way of shutting down botnets. Uh, so once infected, the victim will execute like a script, which will retrieve like the bot binary and then it'll become a bot. So the botnet software in itself tends to latch itself to the startup files, so every time you restart the computer or just start it up, it'll be running. So it's really hard to get rid of them. Uh, so in generally speaking, the bot to IRC server, like communication requires like a combination of two or three types of authentication. So first the bot needs to authenticate itself to the IRC server so the server knows it's not just like some random computer connecting. So uh, it'll send like a special, me special message to it, generally called like a pass message. And um, 
Second, like the bot master will normally protect the command and controls channel. It's called the IRC server or HTTP server. It can, it's called the command and control channel. Uh, and then it'll just protect it with a password. And the password will be in the bot binary. So it'll authenticate it that way. Uh, the third type of authentication, it's kind of not part of the IRC protocol, but it requires the bot master to authenticate himself to the population. So it can be like a rival bot master trying to take over. But generally that does happen, like botnet wars, they come and take over each other's botnet to create an even larger botnet. And then they have an even larger botnet. So uh, that's what you don't want to happen. So they get into really big fights over botnets. <laughs> <laughs> So the first two authentication steps are intended to thwart outsiders from joining this command and control channel and taking control. But the last one is to protect the bots from being overtaken by other bot masters. So once a bot has successfully joined the IRC server, the bot will execute commands from the channel topic usually. Like in the IRC server, um, the bot will look for commands in the title of the channel, or sometimes just the chat relays. So, um, the repertoire of like available commands is like almost anything the bot master can make them do. So it makes botnets really versatile and like almost more valuable than other malware. So like the infrastructure for botnets is pretty simple, I guess. So in a study done by John Hopkins, uh, like out of 318 total binaries collected, 60% of them were IRC servers, so 40 of them, or maybe 39% were HTTP. 1% was whatever else protocols. So most of them are still IRC. And for like the smaller botnets, most of them connected to a single IRC server. So I guess yesterday, these IRC process kind of touched on the fact that if you take down the bot master, you take down the botnet. But so also on a smaller botnet, you can just take down that one server and cut all the bots off, right? But in a larger botnet, they'll link multiple IRC servers together. So that even if you take one down, they'll still be communicating with each other, the rest of them. So the bigger ones are really hard to take down. So like 70% 70, 70 of the botnet is small in like the one IRC server category. Um, but you know, they can always link each other up, like very large botnets will link each other up. And then even if you take down the bot master, they can still send commands to each other. So that's really, that's why they're really hard to take down. So some botnets, are like designed by the same bot master but operated differently. So that even if you take one down, you'll still have like two more. Let's say he has three total. So but when you collect them, a lot of them have like the same conventions, channel names, and operator user IDs. So in those cases the botnets are usually belonging to the same bot master. So if you take down the bot master, you can take down all three of the botnets, which is really useful. So historically, I think the oldest botnet was called Eggdrop, which was like, it turned all the bots into a Trojan, or it used a Trojan to turn all of them into bots. This bot though wasn't really malicious, it was just designed to show the power of botnets, but that was pretty much the only non-malicious botnet. Because after that, people actually realized the potential of botnets, and they did all the bad things they did. So a lot of, Peer-to-peer -peer networks appeared after this, like Napster and Direct Connect, and that's like you know BitTorrent or whatever. So it wasn't it had really nothing to do with botnets, but bot masters you later use that technology to create like botnets that couldn't be taken down by just removing one IRC server. Uh, so in 2002, um, they have a really big botnet up here called Agobot, and it was like really well, it was really widespread because it was really well designed, had a modular code base. So um, it was really dangerous, and at this point, botnets took a turn for the worse, and they became like really malicious and more vicious in just general. So the primary goals of botnets fall under one of three categories, or they can do a combination. Information dispersion, information harvesting, and information processing. So information dispersion, that's like spam, denial of service, or falsifying information. So, you know, like, Email spam or denial service like anonymous will use a tool called low ion low orbit ion cannon and it'll send a bunch of TCP or UDP packets um, to whatever source and that'll that'll crash it and that's called denial service. So that's one tool that a botnet can use. 
and this is a monetary benefit for the Podmaster because they can the advertising companies will pay them to send spam out, so it'll make them money. Uh, so information harvesting is like taking information off the drive, which is like identity data, financial data, password data, relationship data, uh, any type of data available to the whole spot and send it back to the Podmaster. And this data can later be sold, I guess, on the black market for money. So information processing is like breaking hashes or obtaining passwords or breaking algorithms. So this is like useful because they can break an encryption on like a bank and make a ton of money that way or break an encryption on military codes. It's like nation states can use this botnet, I guess, to like break military encryption and take that for themselves. Because why would you want to design your own military program and you can just steal it? Uh, so another use of like information processing, you can spread your botnet and make it bigger. So like once your botnet it grows exponentially, so if you have like two bots, you have four bots, and those four bots, eight bots, it'll keep going. So botnets grow exponentially, so you really generally want to take them down while they're small. Because once they're bigger, then they become peer-to-peer -peer and it's just really hard to take them down. So botnet requires basic computing researches to accomplish its goals. So from the computer, it'll require like computer power, CPU, network, obviously to communicate, memory. Uh, so what else? Um, the metrics kind of surrounding it are like they need an IP list, a port list, a command latency. Uh, they need a little bit of storage on the hard drive, not much. I guess they're just like communicating in port. But they need a little bit to install the binary in the computer. Um, some of them use a time unit. So like at a certain time, they'll all hit it. Like a, they'll DDoS at a certain time. So that's some of them use it. But different botnets will focus on distant, different aspects of the resources. So like a peer-to-peer -peer botnet will focus more on the network resources, or denial of service will also focus more on network resources. So that's really up to the bot master to what resources he needs. So the overall goal of botnets is to make money for the bot master. That's why they're designed. So this is accomplished generally by the bot master renting it out to like cyber criminals or just attackers. So um, one of the first one, or just a good one to look at, is called the Torpig botnet. Uh, it received a lot of attention recently by the security community because it's just really vicious. So on the surface, it's like one of the most harmful malware happening in the internet today. But once installed on the victim's computer, it steals sensitive information and relays it back to the bot master. It uses really sophisticated techniques to steal data from its victims and causes like a ton of financial damage. Like so much. Just by stealing the credit card info, you know, bank account, whatever. It's like so much money just getting stolen. So the botnet is distributed using a rootkit. So even if you reinstall your OS or like use an antivirus program, you'll never find it because it's installed so low in the OSI layer that you'll just never find it. Um, so the rootkit that it's used to distribute this botnet is called Melbrood, which takes control of a machine by replacing the system's master boot record, which uh, allows it to bypass any antivirus and initialize after every startup. So in 10 days, so a bunch of honeypots were put out looking for the Torpig virus, and 10 of them actually caught on. So um, Torpig, in 10 days, Torpig obtained the credentials of 8,310 accounts of four, 410 different institutions and companies. The top targeted institutions just in general are PayPal, um, some Italian company, Capital One, E-Trade, Chase. So those are all big companies and some of them are banks. So that was a lot of money lost, but which is financially data. So it shows like the potential of botnets and if like a really well designed one comes along, then it'll be really hard to stop it and they'll just cause so much financial damage. So the spread of botnets can be like approximated, I guess, in a way. So in a like a worm or executive file, which makes a new it makes a new command controls machine like every once in a while. So eventually they can link up the machines and even if you take that one, they'll still be the rest of them up. So after like new machines have been created, new infections will populate more machines. So it'll make those existing botnets bigger. So this process can kind of be classified under information processing. So the process can be used to create a very large super botnet 
So for simplicity's sake, the process was considered to be using only one worm, but if they're using multiple worms, it would obviously spread a lot faster. So the University of Calgary did a study, uh, starting with like a single seed or a bot, simulation established 15,000 botnets and with 100 machines apiece, and uh, that's 1.5 million uh, computers. But this was just a study, right? It was an approximation, but it shows the potential. That's a lot of bots. So by using two worms, the simulation ran like 43 times faster, and uh, it was, and the three worms was just off the scale. So it was like ridiculously fast expanding. So the simulation kind of proved this trend of botnet spread and their exponential growth. In reality, though, these bots could be distributed by many different botnets. So it's going to be really hard to control the full power of the super botnet because you need to send commands to every single one of the individual botnets. That would be really hard. So in terms of attacks issued by botnets, time bombs are used. I think I touched on this before. So a time bomb is a type of malware that will only activate at a certain time. So this, they can kind of, bot masters can set a bot and say at 3 o'clock, EDOS them, and they'll go to the airport, go to another country, and then they'll attack from that computer. So the authorities will all trace them down to that IP address, but they're not there anymore. So they can't catch them. So time bombs are used very often because of their obvious abilities. But it kind of introduces some security problems because if a defender compromises a single bot, then the time bomb will be discovered well in advance of the attack and they can just shut down the whole attack. So, but also when a time bomb is discovered on a potential botnet, there are several ways to prevent its installation. Like, start it. So they can send a command changing the time so that it'll never go off, like 25 hours or something, I don't know. So then the attack will never go off. So the question kind of comes off to how often a botnet is needed to be compromised in order for a defender to know its intentions. So again, in the University of Calgary that I study, there are 15,000 bots in a botnet, to say. To compromise a botnet on average, 509 bots were needed to be captured, which is roughly like 3.4%, which is just to get like an idea. Destroying a single piece of like command on average would take a lot more bots, like 96% of the botnet. So in real in real reality, compromising individual bots to find the intentions is really like really inefficient and it's almost impossible in the real world. So defending bots is kind of beyond the capabilities of a single user. So one security expert, expert can't go after it. Like multiple companies, like large amounts of people need to go after bots in order to take them down. So but there are more better methods, I guess, for taking them down. The most effective way, obviously, is to locate the bot master, so you can take down the whole thing. Um, and then, like the less efficient method, I guess, is like really all of the infected machines, and then you can quarantine them off the internet, and they're done. So, or you could just rub the commands, which is kind of harder to do. But let's say you, the bot master, is using a public IRC server. It's not private. So if that guy realizes this bot master is sending commands to a bunch of bots on the IRC server. They can block all commands from that bot master, and then there's no bot in anymore. So email spam is one of the most like open problems attributed with botnets, and it's attracted a significant amount of research over the years. 90% of email traffic is spam sent by botnets, so it's a really lucrative field. Um, the emails can include content from like from Nigerian prints large fortunes, uh, medicine scams. So, uh, and then like, I guess people who aren't aware of it will click and they'll lose their credit card. Like, oh, cheap, I'm not going to get a fortune from Nigerian prints and lose all their money. <laughs> so, uh, so that, that makes a lot of money for the bot masters. Like, advertising companies will pay them to like, send it out. So recent studies show about 85% of the overall traffic on the internet is sent by botnets. So like botnets provide two major advantages for spammers. It is it like serves as a convenient infrastructure for sending out large amounts of messages because you can just send a command and all the bots will start sending it out. So uh, essentially it's a large distributed computing system with a very large bandwidth. So it's kind of like a supercomputer except a lot more super. So uh, um, it's really efficient for sending out spam. It can, botnet can, with a thousand machines, can send out tens of millions of emails within a few seconds. So that's a lot of spam. 
uh, and a botnet allows an attacker to evade spam filtering techniques due to this, like, on the sender's IP address. Like, Gmail will sometimes filter it, but every once in a while it'll get through, and that's generally from a really well-designed botnet. Um, and the IP address will change frequently and due to like DHCP lease expiration, that happens pretty often. So it's hard to filter out the IP addresses. Um, so tracking botnets, is a, it's a very arduous task. Because there's like a few methods to do it. Like even if you isolate one bot, the rest of the botnet will continue to go on, right? Uh, so a botnet will like, this, it'll just disconnect that one bot when it's captured and just continue. So a common method of capturing malware and just attackers in general are called honeypots, which uh, one person defined, like the honeynet.org, defined as a tool to discover the tools of attackers, like to, tools, of ta tactics, and motives of attackers. Um, honeypots are kind of useful for collecting information about botnets, how they operate, and they log a lot of data. So it's really it's really easy to reconstruct the actions of attackers and like study them in detail. So like we did a lab I think, and uh, we were able to see like all the packets captured and reconstruct the attack. Um, so that that was really useful. Uh, more common way though of capturing it is like setting up something called a spam trap, which is like they'll set up a bunch of email addresses, like just kind of honeypots except the email addresses. They'll capture email, like junk mail, and see where the sender IP address is, and then they can obtain a list of bots. So that's kind of the inefficient way of doing it, but it's pretty effective. It's kind of counterintuitive. But that's like what most people use. Uh, so, uh, currently, there are measures set up by the internet community in order to prevent the spread of botnets. Some ISPs take countermeasures to prevent like botnets whose IP addresses reserve reside on their network from sending out email messages. So if an ISP has, sees what, like 50 emails sent down in a couple seconds, they know to block it off. Um, there are more countermeasures that can be taken, though like existing blacklists and systems can analyze network level features of emails and can be improved by like improving the accuracy information about machines that are currently sending out spam messages. Um, this will allow security analysts to track down affected bots and shut them down. A large number of bots that are part of a botnet are like can guide and support mitigation efforts that CNC control infrastructures. CNC infrastructures of largest and most aggressive botnets are targeted first. So like finding out which botnet is really doing the most damage, then you can shut them down first. Uh, so mainly bot so like it's pretty much in my presentation. Botnets pose like one of the most severe threats to the internet today, and our knowledge of botnets is kind of incomplete because we've only started studying them kind of recently. To prove our understanding, we need to perform more research in the field to find the weaknesses of botnets, which we don't really know yet. So in summary, research results show that botnets are a major contributor to overall unwanted traffic on the internet, and just they can distribute malware or not. Well, botnets um, contribution to aggravate traffic can mostly be attributed to scams for human victims and like make money for botnets. Botnet scanning behavior is markedly different from other malware because of its manual direction. So it's not automated. You can still track down the guy behind it. So it can be done. Um, so IRC is pretty much the most dominant. But like as I think I said before, you can't track it down. Just security analysts can't track it down. You need the general public to know about botnets so they can stop it on their own individual computer and then you can shut down the botnet. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for him. They can go first. Okay. Uh, so it's very good. It's very informative. That's a lot of work. Okay, and, and it's presented very well. I'm wondering, so there are reports that people try to measure uh, uh, ongoing botnets. Uh, and they say, that, you know, this botnet is a certain size, it seems to be getting smaller, it seems to be getting larger. How do you think, that, how do you think they do it? Okay. Uh, tracking botnets, I guess. Tracking, uh, I mean, yeah, tracking is right, yeah. I think for from the Agrobot variant, they put a honeypot in and we were able to serve it that way. 
the, the specifics? I'm not really quite sure. So, I don't so, think they're used to it. So, so let me ask you Tucker, how do you think they do it? Okay, a, a, a honeypot or a nest? Yeah, definitely. probably a honeypot, and then they're able to see, like, I guess, an approximation of how much traffic they're sending out, and then just by like statistics, they can grab very much. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Nice to die.